that's okay. And then we'll do filters. And that looks all right too. Single cam. Oh, she's not in yet. All right, about to do a stream. In fact, I got to go pee before I start. I'm going to start in a minute and a half. Hey, hey. Oh, thank you. Right. I am muted. See? Because you told me it was a hot mic, so I was trying to address that problem. All right. Well, welcome to episode number seven of This Week in Cloud Native, where I'm going to explore some security stuff. And it looks like I'm getting lost in the fog a little bit, so it might be something I just have to tune real quick. Give me just one moment to get that sorted out. It's always something, you know? I use OBS for this streaming stuff, and sometimes it works really well, and sometimes it's kind of a pain to, to get knocked in just right. But generally speaking, it works pretty well. All right, there we go. 
So this week, I'm going to be digging into some security stuff. It should be a fun episode. I'll be digging into a few different pieces of it. Um, made it just in time. Yeah. It's been a crazy day. It's been a super busy day. One of the reasons it's been a super busy day is because last week um, or, or this week is going to be the EBPF Summit. And so that should be... Um, oh, I just realized... See, that's what I'm talking about. Boink, there we go. So um, this week is the EBPF, EBPF Summit. So Wednesday and Thursday are going to be the EBPF Summit. Let me go ahead and just share with you a little bit of information about that. So here is the wrong screen. So let's see if we can get figure that out. Just bear with me for just a moment while I figure this out. Uh, for some reason, my screen is showing the wrong screen. CD screen zero one. All right, there we go. Transition. And I'm back, and there we go. Now it's all working again, like it's actually supposed to work. All right, here we go. So EBPF Summit, this is what I wanted to show you. If you have not been there yet, go here and come be a part of it. It's a free registration. It's two days of incredible things. There will be an EBPF-based It'll be an EBPF-based CTF, which ought to be super fun for folks. There'll be lots of really great stuff. Um, so yeah, come check it out. It's a free event and it'll be streaming live on YouTube and you can interact with us on Slack. The EBPF Summit um, should be amazing. That's kind of what I've been focused on and clearly there's a lot going on there. So it's been, a, it's been kind of, like I said, kind of a hectic week. But that's what that's all about um, this week in the news. Let's take a look. So I always start off with a reminder that this is a COC official live stream of the, C of the CNCF. So be nice to each other in the chat and be nice to everybody really, really just generally as a rule, if you can, if you can do that. Um, registration for KubeCon Cloud Native North America is 2021 is now open for in-person and virtual to explore the registration options. You can, you can follow this link. Um, one of the exciting things is that the schedule is live. And so if you go to that link, you can actually follow the program piece of it. And you can actually see those events that have been put in here, including this event, which I'm really looking forward to doing. Uh, we were actually able to get a talk in, the, the hacker crew of SigHonk were able to get a talk in for exploring a volume vulnerability uh, that is related to CVE 2021-30465. I'll probably do an episode of this show on that at some point, but I have not done that yet. Um, so it's going to be the four of us, Ian, Brad, myself, and Rory. We're going to be doing a, a, a walkthrough of like what that's about and how it works and uh, like how we uh, went about the research for it and that kind of thing. So that should be pretty fun. But all of the other schedule is up as well. So definitely, definitely go check that out. All uh, right. So... Um, I think I've mentioned this before, but if I haven't, then if you want to catch up with episodes that have already happened, this is a great way to do that. If you go to that link, you'll be able to see the playlist for each channel or for each uh, thing that we've got managed here, including one that just was updated earlier today, um, Search Magic by Siam, and we have Solid State, we have Kunal doing .ed.u, we have um, Maddie doing CNCF face, CNCF face Off. And then there are a number of other shows as well. All really great stuff. Cloud Native Latin X. Fields Tested sounded like it was a complete kick. And so if you haven't had a chance to check out Fields Tested, this most recent episode, probably the one to jump in on. Um, because it was a it was a Caslin going through the um secure Kubernetes.com uh CTF challenge that um Tab Tabitha Sable and Brad and a bunch of other amazing folks worked on at the, at the most recent in-person KubeCon, which was San Diego, gosh, forever ago. We got this week in Cloud Native, we got um, 
that's that's the channel that you're watching now. So as soon as this episode is over, it'll be posted on that playlist. 100 days with a nice cognitive cast room. And all of these things are just up and, and ready for you. So if you miss an episode or if you aren't able to catch a thing that you wanted to see, you can always just go to YouTube and they're all archived there. There's new content every day and there's always something kind of fun happening. So definitely check it out. A quick reminder again that in version 1.22, which is actually going to be the version of Kubernetes that we're going to be playing with live today, um, there have been API removals, which means that some things that worked before are not working anymore, right? So um, if you haven't already read this blog post, please go do it. It's a very important one. It describes just those things that will be removed from, um, uh, from version 1.22. So, for example, I think, you know, likely the stuff that's really going to catch people out, I think we've already kind of been aware that Ingress has been um, updated for some time, so that shouldn't be messing people up too much. But I imagine this one might be a surprise. So custom resource definition changing and having the old API from the beginning of time go away, that might, that might catch people out. Um, one of the big benefits is that in the 120 time frame, we also inserted a warning. So now whenever you're registering a webhook or register or, or leveraging any of these APIs that are about to become removed, you should get a deprecation warning telling you, hey, that is deprecated. Now I spent the last two episodes kind of covering API deprecation and removal. If you want to know more about that, definitely go check out those videos. But a reminder again, if you're playing with Kubernetes and you are unaware of that, you should become aware of that before you move to 1.22. And then back on the blog side of things, I just wanted to share with you a few other things. You can always just go to the blog by blog.kh.io. Easy to remember, it takes you there. There's been lots of really great posts just this month, and I wanted to kind of cover a few of them. And mainly it's it's part of the release cadence of a of a of a release like this one that actually talk where there where you will see um, a number of blog posts kind of referring to different features or or capabilities that are changing, right? And so the 122 release came out, and you can definitely check this one out. There's lots of really big changes in 122, which I think are gonna be really great. And we're gonna look at a couple of them that I'm particularly interested in. Um, we have server-side apply moves to GA, CSI Windows support, which means the, um, the custom storage interface, so being able to actually create new, oh, cool, it deeps in there, to be able to create new volumes and things as a plugin or an, <laughs> will be a GA in 122. And then we have new in version 122, the alpha support for using swap memory. I know Alana has done a ton of work on this, trying to get this in. Um, but basically, this means that you will no longer see the Kubelet crash when you have when you're bringing it up on a system with swap, and that cube and that Kubelet will be smart enough to use that swap reasonably, which I think will be great. Um, these are this is a pretty significant change in 122. Uh, I think since the beginning of the project, or something very close to that, we've always uh, told people to remove the uh, swap capability, like to turn off that swap volume. Um, but now we don't have to do that anymore. So that's I think a good thing. Nope. Well, that was fun. Live. All right, here we go. So that is changing. We also have the Kubernetes memory manager moving to beta talks about the way that memory is managed in the subcomponent. I'm actually curious about this one a little bit, and then we'll dig into the kind of the fun work. So some Kubernetes workload run on, on, on nodes with non-uniform memory access. Now, if you're not aware of what NUMA is, this is a pretty fascinating thing. The idea, they probably get into it. Do they? The idea is that basically the path between the CPU core where your process is being executed and the uh, the memory that that CPU core has access to will be direct from one CPU core to a, to a particular bank of memory, but not direct to the other bank of memory. And so 
depending on what you're trying to do, you can actually incur a cost when you're trying to actually access memory that's in a non-uniform location. And so what this does is it tries, I mean, this is going to be for some really specific work, like trying to make sure that you're operating with as little latency as possible. But with um, NUMA, you can actually address, you can kind of fence that stuff off so that your CPU and memory are the quickest and that you can ensure that those workloads that you're deploying are going to stay aligned on the same NUMA node or locality um, as possible. So you can really drive down that uh, latency, the amount of latency, the amount of latency between your application execution time and the memory that it's accessing. So I know that was a lot to cover, but like it is a pretty interesting thing and that's actually moving along pretty well. So that's exciting. Moving to beta means that it's already been through an alpha period. All right. What else do we have up for today? So I did not see anything in the security announce group, but it never hurts to check again. Nope. Looks like the latest, latest most recent update was in July. So still looking pretty good there. I like to cover those things as they surface. CNCF things. Um, another big announcement from Isovalent this week, actually, is the eBPF Foundation that's going to be a foundation focused on eBPF and like getting the word out, helping people kind of adopt it, figuring out what we can do together as a group. And now with a foundation, we can actually, um, you know, do more of that, do more of that outreach and work. And I think it'll be really great. So Facebook, Google, Isovalent, the company I work for, Microsoft, Netflix are all in it together, and they are announcing, kind of co-announcing the eBPF Foundation. It's a great blog written by Thomas Graff. And one of the things I really liked about this blog was this comic series, kind of like XKDC, XKCD style, describes like why eBPF, like why it's an interesting thing, like why, why folks actually want to see it adopted and what it can be used for. Um, and I think the story is very compelling. Basically like, you know, like you say you, you have some new kernel feature that you want, or you're doing application tracing and you want to be able to see what's actually happening with your application. There are a couple of different ways to solve that problem. There might be a kernel feature that does it, right? And so you might like write that kernel feature to, to enable some particular form of tracing, or you might write a kernel module. Um, but both of these two instances take a bunch of time to actually get something merged into the kernel. And you also might take a bunch of time to get something merged into uh, the distribution of Linux that you're using. And where and Wherein, if we like, you know, expose an eBPF-like interface into the Linux kernel, then you could write that software, as long as it's within the constraints of the eBPF um, ecosystem, you could write that and deliver that much faster. So, pretty exciting stuff. Kind of enabling us to extend the kernel more dynamically and with a much shorter time frame than what it would normally take. So, I just realized that you may not have been able to see anything I was just presenting. Yeah, but I'm back now. So here's the eBPF Summit page. Having a rough rough start today. All right, so. Oh, you didn't see it, just not me. Okay, well, that's good. All right, well, okay. I mean, good enough. I'm excited that that happened. All right, so let's move on. You probably saw me catch my green screen. Oh, no, you didn't, because you didn't see me. Ha ha, my green screen fell over and I had to go save it. Now, the stuff that I wanted to dig in, oh, CNCF things, let's do that first. So we talked about eBPF Foundation. Um, one of the other places I look for weekly news is at Cube Weekly. This is actually a great newsletter put together by my fellow CNCF ambassadors. Um, and so if you're like looking for a good source of news, this is probably the best one that you'll find, or like at least a pretty consistent one that you'll find. Um, there's also the Kubernetes podcast that does a pretty good job of capturing the news. Um, there's a number. Uh, there's also this week in or lwkd.info, another one of my favorites. So LWKD is focused more kind of like on the developer side of things. So like what commits are interesting. Sometimes uh, Josh will pick a particular commit and talk about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, like you see stuff like this. So introduce event clocks based on 
Utils clock, the API server has a new clock in town. The new event clock API provides a more testable approach to delaying calls. Also be sure to check out the follow-up PR, which improves some interface and struct names. So that's, I guess, the commit of the week. Um, stuff that's been deprecated, stuff that's been removed, all kinds of interesting stuff in here. So this is where I go for like development news. And then where I'm going for like community-based news is more like Cube Weekly, lots of, lots of interesting stuff happening there. So it's always some kind of fun article or some interesting technical thing happening inside of Cube Weekly. So definitely check it out. Uh, the ones I called out today in the news section were the ones that were coming up for the CNCF. So they were managed thousands of K8 application and minimal with minimal efforts using Cube Carrier. I haven't explored this one. It looks pretty interesting to me. It's hosted by Kubernetes, Zhejiang Zhu. And if you wanted to check that out, that's happening on the 19th, which is uh, coming right up. And then also on the 19th, Meshri will be talking about, or Lee Kalkot from Layer 5 will be talking about the Service Mesh Manager. And then uh, Sean McCord and Andrew Reinert from Talos Systems will be talking about hybrid Kubernetes clusters with WireGuard. Um, and all of those things are happening on the 19th. So if any of those are interesting to you, definitely check it out. Quality has improved again. Oh, interesting. I don't know why that happened. So let me take a look at the chat here. Yeah, we missed a real action. It's true. Oh, it looks okay to me. Weird. I wonder if it has to be like refreshed or something. All right, so let's play with this stuff. So there were the two things that I wanted to kind of play with today. I'm not sure we'll have time to get to both of them, but we're going to give it a try. Um, one thing I know, uh, one thing I want, wanted to play with was this new change in 122, which is behind a feature gate. Um, we're going to use kind to kind of explore that. Uh, doo -doo -doo. There it is. I like how it says feature. Your Kubernetes server must be running. Here we go. OK, that's a bug. I think I'm going to. This is confusing to me, and I'll tell you what I'm seeing, and then you can tell me if it's confusing to you. But what this says in the docs is restricted containers, syst calls with seccomp, feature state, 119, stable. I'm like, yeah. And then I go down here, and it says, before you begin, you must be running version 1.22. And I'm like, wait. And then down below a little further, to enable the use of runtime default, and this is the thing I wanted to test, as a default seccomp profile for all workloads, it's behind a feature gate called seccomp default, which is configured at the kubelet. And you can tell it which particular thing to use. By default, um, I know that I'm using the word default a lot, but it, the way the way out of the out of the box, we'll put it that way. Um, what ends up happening is that the kubelet uses um, un, unconfined as the de, as the default seccomp profile. And I'm going to show you why that's interesting and why that's like for sick, you know brought not super secure. And then we're also going to play with this new model where we can actually define like. Um, at the kubelet level, what the actual default should be. And we'll talk about that, and we'll talk about Docker runtime defaults, and we'll talk about like you know container runtime defaults in general, those sorts of things. So that's what we're going to dig into in this episode. And I think that'll probably take us right up to the right up to the hour, but I wanted to kind of play with it. I wanted to let you know what we're going to dig into, and then we're going to play with it. So and then the other one, which I might save for another episode, but I'd like to cover it. There's an incredible cap that's actually moving forward. It's in alpha now. So it's already got an alpha, um, it's already got a feature gate. And this is a replacement for uh, pod security policies. And so this one is, I blame DNS, nice. Um, this is this is my, uh, my motto, really. So thank you for that, Russ. Um, So this is a replacement for pod security policies. And it greatly simplifies the model that pod security policies follow to interact with things. 
And I wanted to play with this because I wanted to play with like how it works and like what it looks like and all of that good stuff. I haven't actually um, started this one up locally yet. And so I think I might come back and do this another time, but it's already in the 120, 122 code base as a um, behind a feature flag. And I thought we might explore that probably in the next episode, just kind of play with it. Cause I have spent a big amount of time like helping people understand pot security policies. Yeah. Save yourself there a little bit. Um, but I'm going to be digging into this one probably in the next episode or perhaps the, perhaps the episode after. But yeah, I think that'll be probably the right way to go. But we're going to talk about why pot security policies are good too. So let's get started. Let's go ahead and build our uh, kind cluster with just like nothing special going on. And then I want to show you kind of like what you can detect and, and what you can determine from like those system calls that are available and that sort of stuff. So let's dig into it. All right. There's one more thing I wanted to grab here. We'll do it in a minute. So kind create cluster config. Change that definition just a little bit. Four, let's see. Next, I'm going to go to the kind project, which is kind.sigs. And the way kind, one of the one of the nice features of kind is that it has the ability to, you can define inside of your configuration manifest feature gates, which make it really simple to turn stuff like this on, right? So I'm going to say feature gates. And then back over here again to this guy. And this guy says the feature gate is So we're going to have to do two things there, it appears. So this will be kind of a fun exercise because so we're going to do up default. Oh, interesting. OK, well, we may only have to do the one. Well, let's see. So the way I'm reading this is it's saying that uh, it's a, it's a um, feature flag that you determine, you can set the feature flag setcomp default, and this enables the use of runtime default as the default setcomp profile for all workloads. And the setcomp profile specified in the security context of a pod or a container. Now, if we go back into the docs, 
on the other side of things a little bit here. The runtime default is going to be whatever the default seccomp profile built into your runtime is. So container D has a runtime default. Uh, Docker has a runtime default. Um, both of these runtime defaults actually limit the system calls that a given process that has been containerized can run. That's so weird. I don't know why it's blurry at all. I mean, what's weird is also like in the in the read in the read back to me, I'm not seeing the blurriness. I only see y'all telling me it's blurry. Weird. Okay. Anyway, so I do like high def duff. I get the highest def duff. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I'm I'm streaming at the full at the full. Uh, Full resolution, 1080p, 30. Mm. Weird. Well, we'll figure it out. Anyway, back to this. Because it's a complex topic, so I want to speak slowly, and I want to make sure that you understand what I'm talking about as we get into it. Actually, I'm not even streaming from OBS. I'm streaming, basically, I mean, I am streaming from OBS, but it's coming out of virtual cam interface that is going directly as a camera into um, Restream. We're using Restream for this. So maybe Restream is having a problem. But I guess we'll figure it out. So yeah, let's go back to our hack and be. So this is what we're going to talk about. I am going to, you know, for some now, I'm going to go ahead and delete this one for now. I'm going to take you through this set of questions real quick. So these are the this 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 is basically what we're going to dig into here first, and then we're going to play with the new feature gate that sets runtime default. So to give you a little background, setcomp is a way of um, providing a kind of a rule set for processes that have been generated inside of a container that can limit or otherwise constrain those processes to specific system calls that are reasonable for those processes so that so that you can't do things like i don't know reboot the node or um you know delete things or do I mean, do things do, you can't see anything i'm thinking this is a twitch thing All right, y'all. Okay. Very weird. I'm thinking maybe there's like a Twitch thing or something. All right. So yeah, so let's get into it. Let's keep moving here. So I'm going to show you a little bit about SecComp and what SecComp's about, and then we're going to play with this stuff. So first, let's just go ahead and run like using Docker. You can do you can do this on your own system as well.
What is the command for that? You know, I always forget it. Docker run unconfined. This page, by the way, is amazing. So if you're ever, if you want to learn more about SecConf, this is a great way to do it. Um, reading the Docker docs for SecConf are are amazing. So there is an option where you can tell it security ops seccomp equals unconfined. That's the profile. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. So let's grab that over here. And we'll go over here. We'll do Docker run. Actually, just paste it in. And what this command is going to do is it's going to start up a little bash shell. Bash, bash. And inside of that bash shell, we can look at the capabilities that we have running as root inside of this container. And then we're, we're going to run the same command without the security opt flags and see what the runtime default uh, um, capabilities are. And then we can kind of compare the two of them, right? So if I do apk add lib cap, I do capsh print. I'm going to go ahead and capture this. And we'll head back over here to our HackMD. And find. Now, remember, you can actually go to this HackMD yourself directly and help me edit it, put notes in, that kind of stuff. That is available to you um, right here at the bottom where it says hackmd.io slash at TWICN. If you go to that URL, you're going to find a path to 007, which should take you directly to the notes that I'm using today. So if you want to see these notes yourself, you can hit them up right there. So that would be hackmd.io slash at TWICN. And then the seventh episode is the one that we are on. So you should be able to click right in here and see that episode. All right. Yeah, I'm not sure what the problem is and I'm not sure how to address it because it seems like things are okay on my side. Oh, it says network connection 810. Well, I could drop and come right back, I suppose. Well. But hmm. let me try that. Let me try just doing, let me just try doing this first. All right, I'm back. And according to the connection, it says that it's high quality now. So hopefully we will no longer see any of this blurriness. I'm hoping that takes care of it. We'll see how it goes. Let me know if you see it some more. Maybe I'll try that again after. All right. So these are the capabilities that we have in an unconfined mode, which are pretty significant. And it's mainly because there's not very many limiting calls here, right? So basically, you can do pretty much anything. Um, CapNet raw is there. Cap owner. 
quite a lot of capabilities in, in an unconfined mode. So now let's look at what that looks like in a confined mode. Then we can compare the two and see what it looks like. OK? So jump it over here, exit out of this. Now all I'm doing is getting rid of this set comp bit here. Run this up again, and then we'll do apk add libcap, part of the Linux capabilities uh, package. That's what the cap here in this case is uh, capabilities. And then we can do capture print. You can even put it, spell it right. And then we can grab that outcome. And we'll drop that over here on the HackMD. And we can see that our bounding set. Oh, interesting. Oh, you know what? I'm doing the wrong command here. Maybe that's what's happening. Curl. OK, add curl. curl. OK, it's not work. Am I contained? Those are the capabilities that have been granted me, but what I am not seeing in that outcome or in that output is what capabilities are being filtered from me. And the neat thing is That's what I'm looking for. Bong. All right. So this is the runtime defaults. And I'm going to put this back over here where we can see it in the HackMD. What I wasn't doing is negative testing, right? And that's basically the problem. What Emma Contain does is it actually goes through, like, and for each system call that it could make, it tries to make the call to see if those things are filtered or not filtered. And in a filtering state, which is what we see here for container runtime in Docker, there are 60 block system calls, right? And that is a good thing. And we're going to talk about, I mean, if you want to know more about why that's a good thing, definitely check out the SecComp page inside of um, the Docker documentation because they really get into, like, exactly why this is the way it's done this way. And I think it's a, a really good article on like what SecComp is and why it's important. Okay. So these are filtered messages, right? So I can't do things like, you know, m mess with NFS exports. And I can't do things that are that would otherwise um, that would otherwise mess me up. Things like uh, set domain name. I mean, it's a little it's a little more subtle than than why, you know, but like there's a bunch here that are actually filtered out. Now, if I go back and I pull up our unconfined one and I do apk add curl and I grab curl uh, minus lo, just like we did before. k8s.work slash. Am I contained? Page that work is my domain for this stuff. And then I could do change mode plus X. Uh, 
and I'm going to continue. Now we can see the list of blocked system calls is significantly smaller. There we go. So in this case, in this state, we can see setcomp has been disabled, but there are still some system calls that are blocked. Swap on, swap off are blocked, reboot, set host name. Some things have been blocked, but not nearly as much as what's been blocked here in the lower end. And what these are, these are basically uh, system calls that have been picked that are likely to uh, affect the overall performance of the system rather than um, and be outside of what a normal process might do, right? And so in this baseline um, suck on profiling, like you, likely you've probably never even noticed that it was there because this set of system calls that has been limited here um, really are just there to um, keep you within the bounds of a regular process, right? It's trying to be as restrictive as it can without being so restrictive that you ever notice that SecComp is actually in place. And at the same time, like, get rid of stuff like, you know, giving you the ability to insert new modules or to, to remove modules or, all, you know, things like this that you probably shouldn't necessarily be able to do as just a running application inside of a container on a Kubernetes node. They want to limit that stuff. And that's why there are 60 blocks, block system calls here when you're, when you're using the Docker defaults. And there's only 20 block system calls if you have disabled setcom. I have never noticed. See, isn't that weird? Wow, it is weird. It is blurry again. Oh, well, I tried. What is this? Net error cert common NA me valid, name invalid. Are you throwing TLS errors at me, Dan? Dave? Oh man, I did that, Russ. You should watch the episode where I was the attacker, um, where it was actually Sig Honk got the credit for the attack. But I wrote a thing where <laughs> it was so brutal. I like, I did a bunch of the work on the on, on the on the environment, and what I had done was I had written it so that when he SSH'd in, he would actually like drop into a scenario where he was in a container that was in a read-only file system. And he had to realize that SSH was listening on two different ports and SSH over to the other port so that he could escape that. How kind of trippy. All right, let's move on. So yeah, so these are the kind of um, things that are filtered and why they're filtered. And if you want to know more about that, like I said, definitely check out the Docker seccomp documents. In fact, I should just put a link here. inside of the HackMD so it doesn't get lost. All right. So the next question we had was like, what capabilities do I have in an unconfined mode versus like what are Docker's defaults? But we haven't looked yet at what container D's defaults are. So let's look at that next. And for that, I'm actually gonna do this an easy way for myself. I'm just gonna go ahead and start up a kind cluster because I know that kind runs container D under the covers. Kind create cluster config before we'll get this guy started up here
Yeah, kind is pretty awesome. I agree completely. Yeah, plus 1,000. Yeah, you could even, I mean, and we might try this, but like um, you can, anything you can do with Cube ADM, you can tune with Kind. In fact, one of the interesting side projects of Kind, while this is booting up, why don't we just go look at that real quick? So um, one of the interesting side projects of Kind is that you can do a thing where it's called Kinder. And Kinder is, or Kinder, Kinder, or however you want to say it, Kinder is the uh, is tooling that is used by KubeADM to test the KubeADM software. And if you don't know about KubeADM, KubeADM is tooling that is used to turn a bunch of nodes into a Kubernetes cluster. It's like a bootstrapping tool. You know what's funny is I always think of Kinder as like this particular elf-like creature in old D&D books. Like that was my exposure with with. with with Kinder, it was like an elf-like creature. So Kinder does a bunch of things that Kind does not do. And so if you're really into Kind, you might be interested in this because it does a bunch of different things. Like you can use Kinder to um, bring up a cluster in different uh, with different runtimes. You can bring you can use you can stop the process where you want it and reinstantiate particular parts of the process, the KubeADM process where you want it. And so there's a ton of stuff that Kinder does that are kind of out of the scope of the usual kind project, but it is pretty amazing. The way less painful since 110. Yes, for sure. Also, it's still kind of like the premise behind things like cluster API. So Kubernetes is, 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 you know, continuing to move forward. So if you're interested, Russ, if, if you're interested in um, kind, definitely check out Kinder and it's under the Kubernetes, uh, I guess it's actually in the main repo, surprisingly enough. Q, uh, main repo, KubeADM project underneath Tree Master Kinder. And it's pretty neat. Might be kind of a fun episode to do on that, actually. So, probably booted up by now. Yeah, there we go. Oh, that's not what I wanted. I wanted a cube kettle. Is this me? Y'all are making me wonder if my internet connection is trash suddenly. Downloads at 400 meg. Uploads at 300 meg. So it's probably not me. Because I should definitely be able, be able to eke out a, a broadcast stream for that. Like, my goodness. Is there something... Consuming my CPU. That's the connection we're on. There's OBS. Nothing super obvious. Although there is a lot of usage going on. So this should start up the same bash image that we saw before from Docker. Do apk add curl. And then we'll do uh, capture, actually 
add caps. Right. Lib cap. Caps print. And here we have our bounding set, which looks very, very similar in my mind to the unconfined set that we saw before. Let's go ahead and grab those and we'll put them over here. Uh, let's do our filtered test just like we did before, and we can look at the output of that. You freeze for a few seconds before it drops in quality. So something may, maybe something is dropping quality automatically if frames I drop for a bit. If that's the case, boy, that's irritating. That might be the, that might be the case because if I'm not moving, then it's like yeah, that's all that's all I'm going to send. Uh, that's I mean, I guess my alternative would be to stream would be to stream to restream using OBS and bypass the the camera in thing. But the problem with that is that I can't do stuff like this. That's actually why I'm using it. So I can highlight very valuable comments. So we can see that the defaults, we can see two things from this output. We can see that the defaults that we're in um, are not limiting much at all. It's the same like 20 system calls that are limited. And I didn't have to tell it to go to, to a, go to an unconfined mode. By default, it's already in an unconfined mode. So inside of Kubernetes, if you don't use something like sec security context to specify a seccomp uh, profile, then you don't get one. It's unconfined. No, no, don't do it, Dave. It is valuable. I hope you know I was just kidding. All right. So we've done three things, and we've seen different outputs, right? The first thing we did was we ran Docker in an unconfined mode, and we saw that we were able to make everything but 20 system calls. And then we ran Docker in a, um, in a default mode, which meant that we were using the Docker runtime default. And we saw that they were like 80, or is it 90? It might be 90. Boop, boop, boop. Let's take a look. So filtered, that's the, un, that's the unlimited one. 60, sorry. There were 60 uh, system calls that Docker limits by default um, that are there that we can see the output of. Now what I'm curious about and what I wanted to play with in this episode was if we reconfigure our Docker, our, our kind cluster with that feature gate, then it should make it so that when I just do a Docker run of a command of a, of a container, then what that means is that I would be running in the, the default runtime mode, which should limit the number of system calls that I can make as just every container in the system. Should we take a look at that? I think that'll be the interesting part. Exit out of here. I'm going to do kind, create, oh, wait, hold on, M after, run, it was runtime default, right? I think it was. Nope. 
It is a second default. Is an optional kubelet uh, feature gate, as well as corresponding seccomp default command line flag. Oh, both have to be enabled to use the feature. Ah. Well, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. In theory, this should not work, but I, I want to see it anyway, because that's how I roll. Uh, kind create cluster config equals after name equals after. Because I already have a kind cluster brought up with before, then I can't, I don't want to create, I don't want to mess with it. So I'm creating a new one with a new name called after, and we should be able to see that. I was going to ask how Cades tells the runtime to allow that, but how, but they both have to be active. Yeah, that seems weird to me. I thought that, like, effectively as a feature gate, then it should be kind of configuring that stuff. But, right? Like science. It is science. While that's coming up, I am going to look up two things. <laughs> this will be a fun one. So, according to this, copy. Let's go look at the reference for You would think that, okay, maybe I would think that the second profile, I would, I, I wouldn't have to up, apply this on every on everything, but it looks like I do. So, split my thing horizontally here so we can see this happening. We're going to make a patch. Do, do, do. And for this, a couple different things we're going to have to do, but we're going to, oh, you know what? This isn't going to work. Anybody know why this isn't going to work? I'll tell you why. We don't know. I just saw this myself. I'll give you a hint. The answer is on this line. Anybody? Anyone? This is a feature flag in version 1.22. Ha ha. Yeah, exactly. You got it. And I believe that Mr. That we just pushed Docker Hub. Um, and I think we just pushed a new image, which was the oh, kind dest. Mm, there we go. Node. I think we just pushed a new image that was one twenty two when it got released. One way to go see that is to look at the tags on the kindest node project in Docker Hub. 1220. Pushed by Mr. Ben Elder himself. Copy. Oh. This node. There we go. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so that should take a minute while it downloads. I'm going to go to github.com. And I'm going to swipe some work I did before to understand how patching works. Actually, you know what? We should be able to get the same output from here. Extra mounts, extra port mappings. There we go. So this guy. It's part of the init configuration. And then we also have, so we have init configuration, cluster configuration, cube proxy configuration, and kubelet configuration. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be hacking that extra command line option in. The difference between join and init is really interesting, but you can concept you can conceptualize it like um, join takes care of things when you're adding a node that is not a control plane or the very first node that you're creating. Init handles things that are just on the the way that maybe Kubelet would be configured on that node that is part of the control plane or one of the very first nodes that you're creating. So if you have init and join both defined, then you know you're going to be covered. But if you only have one covered then you're only going to be manipulating the things that are going to be like the first thing into the cluster. So I think that should have us there on the configuration. So let's take a look at this here. Kubectl get or run it bash image equals bash. Same bash program we had before, add curl, curl minus lo, cage.work slash am I contained, x, 
and we see no difference. Still 20 syscalls, so, and syscomp is still disabled. So it's definitely not, it's definitely working as advertised. You must at least have both created. So I'm going to go ahead and do kind delete cluster. Name after. I'm going to write this. And then we're going to do kind create cluster after v1220. And let's see if we get it. Hopefully, this actually works the way we expect, and we're able to see it. That would be tremendous. Do, do, do. Let's take a look. Looks like things are kind of taking a minute to start up here. I don't know why the control plane's taking so much longer. This used to be much faster. And so I'm, I need to dig into like what's happening here. But one thing we can do though, because the nodes have been created, but they haven't been joined yet. So Ooh, interesting. Not very happy. So somewhere, probably in the way that I've specified the command line flag, things are not working very well. So let's see here. Parsing runtime default invalid syntax. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do kubelet help. And I'm going to get kicked out. All right. So it looks like the argument passed, but what the content was, the content was incorrect. And what I saw before looked like that was right. So what if I get rid of this? Oh, you leave it empty. This is a weird curse, you know, it's kind of a blessing and a curse, right? The blessing is, hey, if you mess up the configuration, you can go look at the configuration and see why it's messed up. The curse is, if you mess it up, then you have to go look at the configuration and see why you messed it up. It's kind of a pain. Yeah, I don't know what's happening. I I mean, oh, nope. Nope, still unhappy. Okay, here's what I really wanted to know. Kubelet. Oh. Two greater than one.
Setcomp default. Enable the use of runtime default as a decom. Yeah. Feature gate must be enabled to allow this flag, which is disabled by per default. And the setcomp profile root string, which is fine. The second default, oh. Yeah, the second default feature flag is enabled. The second default argument is being specified. Runtime default is the only argument. I wonder if we're running into a bug. That'd be shocking, wouldn't it? Kind create cluster name equals after equals kindest node v one twenty two zero. Oh, oh, that's why. <laughs> Config equals after. It's all good. What do you mean you can't read any of the errors? Like, is my text fuzzy again? Or is it just that it's going by so fast? If it's the second thing, we're in good shape. While we're waiting for this to boot up, I think I can actually see that this is my case real quick. I just want to prove it. Oh, I did it right. Arg. I'm gonna to have to figure this out for next time. I don't know why I don't know why this is happening. But I know it's not my connection. Life of a streamer. Yep. It's true. That's a good question, actually. I don't know the answer to that one. If so, I could always just redo this episode if it's all messed up. It should be all right. We should get our cluster here in a second, and then we can see if this works. Oh, you know what? It's the same problem, probably. I think we are kind of running into the same problem. Yeah. All right. Well, hmm.
I think we're going to go a little off the reservation here and see if we can figure this out manually. So I'm going to go ahead and break, bring up. I'm in the middle of a stream, just so you know. And I'm going to do which, actually, I'm going to do pgrep cubelet minus A. I'll start. I'll cut all minus up all you cubit. That's still broken. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go mess with the cubit itself to figure out if I can figure out what the parameters should be. So let's see. And the actually it should be under var live, right? So let's see. So there's the param, param. Wait, what is that? Oh, okay, just extra args. So I'm gonna go ahead and edit that. Let's see if we can get that working. Varlib, kubelet, kubadm, flags environment. Update. It is rather like clustered, yeah. My whole life is kind of like clustered, really, which is, I think, par partially why I was so excited to see that show start up. And I think David's doing such an amazing job with it. Like, um, all right. Now we have the tools. Let's get this figured out. Really? 10. Uh, 43. Um, I live cubelet, QADM. So this is what's being passed as extra args at the moment. So what if I wrap this in some quotes? Mm, yep. Same error. It's basically telling me that the argument that I've passed is not, it's a, the text isn't being parsed. What if I get rid of it? What if it's just like that? I just saw an interesting output. So set comp default feature gate must be enabled in order to use a set comp default flag. Maybe, ah, oh, maybe our whole problem the whole time has been the feature gate's not working. Uh, after YAML? That looks right to me. And So there's two ways we can enable this feature gate. So there's a feature gate enablement that goes this way, 
right into the configuration piece of it. And then we could also just patch the kubelet with that particular feature gate. Oh, this is a cluster wide thing, which I would have thought would have actually worked out. Kubernetes feature gates can be enabled cluster wide across all Kubernetes components with the following config. Maybe I need to go back and look at the instructions a little bit more. No quotes in their example, but that's how they're turning it on. So that really should work. Provides the minimum required Kubernetes and setcomp default feature is in the kind configuration. So here it is. All right. What if I do that? Right, yeah, I got that. And I did it. But I think I was quoting it. Maybe the quotes were messing me up. I've been burned by quotes before. Oh, good question. That's a very good question. It'd be kind of wild. Knowing how kind works, that would kind of blow my mind, Dave. But you know, I'm ready for that. We're good. Yeah, and I, that's another good point. It is documented only in the 122 side, so I can see that, yeah. But it's complaining about is that it says that the feature gate's not enabled. So I think what I'm going to do, I think we're having a bug where the feature gate's not getting populated down. Varlib kubelet. Fig prep dash i feature. Oh, nope, that's not it. The feature gate is being populated. Setcom default is being set to true. And pgrep dash a kubelet, or I guess we setcom default is set to runtime default just like it says in the docs, but it's not doing the thing.
Hmm. You're right, Dave. This stuff does happen. But I just checked, and we are on 122 on the kubelet. Also, we were reading the docs, and the docs would only be embedded in a kubelet that was running, that had that feature gate enabled. And so what I mean is I was reading the output of help. Um, so if I was reading the output of kubelet help, and uh, and I'm seeing jazz about seccom profiles, then it should sign. It should sign me off on that one. Russ, I can see that the feature gate is enabled in the kubelet configuration, and I can see that I'm passing in the argument. Um, right? Yeah. I'd be wild to. The setcomp default feature gate must be enabled in order to use the setcomp default flag, but it is. So I think we're hitting a bug. It's either a bug or there's a typo somewhere super not obvious. Pretty sure we got a bug. Because for all the world, Fail to load kubelet config file, varlib kubelet config.yaml, error fail to decode, feature gates read boolean, expect t or f found slash. So I can't quote the true, that's for sure.
I was able to make a change in the config file, which changed the feature gates that were enabled. And that shows me that that is set correctly. It works, it works out pretty well. So this is set comp default true, and that seems to be applying. And then when I go back to the Kubelet M's, I wonder if they're just making it not not obvious that you need to have that you need to know what the default is and specify the right thing there. Although then the error would be different, right? Because the error at the moment. Unknown flag. Is that my bad? Oh, that is my bad. Invalid argument. Parse pool. What? What if this is actually supposed to be true? Failed to validate kubelet flags. The seccomp feature gate must be enabled. So however they're doing the validation of the seccomp feature gate appears to be incorrect. Because this looks correct. Yeah, that's what we get for playing with the sharp stuff, you know? So comp default. Now oh, that looks right. Okay, well, yeah, not a bad idea. Let's try. That'd be super weird. If you get this, if you get it right, I'm gonna send you like stickers or something. There is, however, this option, which means I think, you know, they're not taking into account the dynamic So what this does is it basically, it's a command line flag that tells which feature gates are enabled. Uh, let me just go over here real quick. We'll look at Kubelet. Uh, 
Control F feature gates. Next. I think that's what's happening. Dash dash feature, which I think you pointed out earlier, or one of you two did. Okay, so it is a Boolean. Maybe if I put it on the command line itself, that'll be enough to get me there. Wow, now it's trying to actually load the uh, So the config was definitely correct when it was capitalized. Oh, wait, did it really work? Yes. OK. Here's what we're going to do. We now have a way forward. Delete. Cluster name equals after. Then after YAML. Feature. Default equals true. Okay. Kind, create cluster. Config after. Name after. Image. Kindest node v one twenty dot twenty two. Drum roll, please. I'm invested now. I like that. Okay, so basically, what I saw was if I pass it, if I pass on the CLI, the command line for cub for cubelet. Uh, it was actually it was actually taking it. Oh my bad. And there were two things that were happening. So like in the cubelet security file, you had you had uh, I had tried out lower casing the seccomp default flag, and as soon as I did that, the error in the logs changed, telling me that it can't be lowercase. That was my bad. So I put it back to the correct case. But then the problem was that the um, even though it's the correct case, the it, it appears that it only checks the command line flags. So if that feature gate isn't in, isn't on the command line of the kubelet binary, it's not showing up. And so the testing for whether that feature gate is enabled or disabled, uh, that's the bug, is that it's only validating that against the command line and not against the actual uh, configuration of the kubelet. Wow, we're already an hour and some change in. I'm almost done, though. I just wanted to see this work. And then I wanted to show it, and then we're going to close it out. So we're almost there. Thank you for hanging out. It was fun to kind of deep dive into kubeADM and troubleshoot and all that stuff. These alpha features, you know, super sharp edged. One oh four two nine eight two oh 
for make. Correct, Russ. That was the problem. Kubelet fails to start if dynamic Kubelet config feature gate is enabled. No, this is not the same thing. Since 122, enabling the feature gate on Kubelet causes the Kubelet to fail to start. Nope. In my case, that was working OK. Also, I wasn't trying to do dynamic Kubelet config. The problem was more that um, I needed to get it. The way I read this, what he's asking about is, so the Kubelet can hold, so a dynamic configuration means one that you can actually reconfigure on the fly. And I'm not using that, that functionality. Oh, interesting. OK, maybe you're right. Yeah, it is related. Well, if we had oodles of time, I would grab this patch and prove that it works. Oh, uh, but it still doesn't. So we're still seeing the same fault. Dang it! This is the this is my last shot at it too. What if I get rid of this? Oh, you know what? That's why. This is supposed to be true. That was the other thing I figured out. Do, 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 do. Okay. So then. Come on. Thank you, Dave, for pointing that out. You're totally right. I might try building that later and seeing, building with that patch later and seeing if it actually solves this problem for me. But I think that was the problem that I think you've highlighted the actual issue. I don't know. I think it's a hard tie between the two of you. Probably still got a problem, though, because the control plane's still not coming up. Yeah, same problem. Hmm. 
You know what? I wonder if it's like you have to all have all three. Bim after. That would not be surprising to me. Let's give this one more try, and then I'm going to call it one way or the other because I'm out of time. And it's bedtime for you. Are you in uh, the UK or where in the world are you that it's bedtime? Or is it always bedtime? Berlin, Germany, nice. Oh yeah. All right, same problem. That's all the time I have for this today. We may come back and visit this another time and get it working. But at the moment, I'm going to look at the error real quick. After control plane, bash. Journal uh, kettle, minus FLU, cubelet, crap. Oh. Same error. Yep. Well, don't go enabling this flag yet. I'm just saying. Probably not the way to go. Anyway, um, thank you both. And thank you, anybody, everybody else who's maybe or may or not be may or may not be listening. I appreciate you. I'm glad you were here. I had a bunch of fun. I'm going to Try the next thing I'm going to try is actually grabbing that patch from Xmudri and building it with that patch and seeing if that actually solves my problem also. But I do suspect that this is a bug that we are running into. So thank you all so much, and we'll see you next time. Have a great, great week. Uh, week. <laughs>